guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 200, featuring part two of my interview with Mr. Jeff Tunnell, the founder of Dynamics and an all-around groovy guy. This part of the interview, we focus in on the flight simulation games, Red Baron and A-10 Tank Killer. We also talk about the early graphical role-playing games, uh, Rise of the Red Dragon and Willie Beamish, and much, much more. We've got a lot to cover here, including a lot of the questions that you guys sent in to the show. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Jeff Tunnell. Well, just to skip forward a little bit, I had a write-in from Sasha Balkow, Balkow, maybe it's his, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but he uh, wrote in about Project Firestart. Yeah. He says, it's one of the finest games ever made for the C64. You know, I did a review of that game, uh, I guess, last year, too. I was just wondering what you, what you could tell us about that game. The most painful game I've ever worked on in my entire career. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> uh, that you was, worked on a lot, too, so that's saying something. That was hard. It was... Um, I mean, we just absolutely, we were trying to do way too much, but we actually pioneered a lot of stuff in that game, you know, like cutaways and cut scenes and all kinds of things like that and tried to make this, you know, it kind of predated all the you know, horror games that are on the market now. And I don't even like horror, but we ended up, um, EA wanted us, you know, we, we pitched the game and EA wanted us to do it. And Damon ended up going off and working on a different product, and I ended up being the director and designer and everything on that product. And it was just, honestly, I mean, we didn't know how hard it was going to get, but I think we worked on that game for about three years. And we used absolutely every piece of memory in the Commodore. And the, the one, the coolest little story about that or the anecdote was that um, our programmer, uh, Darius Lukasuk was he found 10 bytes in the ROMs that he could use and it was he was ecstatic because we found <laughs> these 10 bytes that we could use to point to different things uh, because we were just absolutely out of memory so, but we did get it to work and we shipped it unfortunately we were we were kind of done with our electronic arts um, our partnership at that time if you remember back in the day that EA would sign up developers like us and they just had they had a contract that was that thick. It was, seriously, it was, they, and they they owned you. They didn't own you, but they had you tied up pretty much lock, stock, and barrel with right of first refusal, first option, and all this kind of thing. And nobody else would sign with them because of you couldn't go out and, and sign with somebody else. And so we ended up buying out of that contract, and we had already bought out of the contract. And so when we finished up Project Firestart, they just was fire and forget. And so it was. It was all over. It the game barely ever got reviewed or anything. So, I I really thought it was great justification that, you know, twenty years later or whatever it was that people came back and played it and 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 liked it and said it was good. And so that was that was vindication because honestly, for all those years we didn't know if we made anything that was good or not. So it felt that I I enjoyed that part, but we made no money on that project. A lot of people say that it's the first true uh, survival horror game. Yeah, I, I think it was. I mean, it was ridiculous to even try to make something like that on the Commodore. But well, why, why we, did you try to make it on the Commodore? Why did we? Because the Commodore was the only machine around, and you know, we were constantly at that point. We were, we were drinking the the Trip Hawkins Kool Aid. Can a computer make you cry? You know, and we were we were trying to push the envelope and see if we could see if we could make it happen. And um, so we were constantly making games like that. We. We would go into games. I think everybody at that point, though, was making. You know, you would, you'd just shoot for as high as you could possibly go. We didn't know what games could do, and and everybody was pushing really hard to see to see what you could make happen, and uh, and that, that's what we did on that game. It was, I mean, it was crazy. Like, like I said, it was crazy to even try to make that game. And, and nowadays, I wouldn't let myself make that game. But you know, back then we didn't know if because there was also still the if you did make something and it was a big hit, then uh, you know, you got, you got well rewarded for it, and so it, it it really made a lot of sense to really swing for the fences. Okay, I got another right in. This is Joachim Edvard Dinavirta. Wants to know where the idea for Caveman Uglympics came from. I'm trying to think. Um, well, Greg Johnson was the designer, the Toe Jam and Earl guy, if you remember him. Um, we were working. We met Greg through Electronic Arts, and I think it was just a bunch of guys sitting around the table 
trying to figure out at, at that point we were shooting for hits you know that was that was a big ea funded project and we were trying to take on um, california games and those kinds of things and so it just came up with uh you know that one's not very romantic that was more <laughs> Let's let's figure out how we can take on California games and um, summer games and all those kinds of. That was just a big hit at the time, and those kinds of things. And uh, no, I loved but Cave Mag Olympics was fun, and the the big deal on that one was um, we were working with EA, and uh, I was trying to expand the studio a little too fa our studio a little too fast, and I hired a guy that was working on it and. And it just wasn't looking that good, and I didn't think it was looking that good. And I hadn't, I hadn't at this point become um, a real designer or anything yet. So I had designed some things, but but I I was willing to just go along with things. And I just thought, you know, this game doesn't look good. And when we turned in our first prototype and we got paid for it, and I thought, well, I guess if EA is going to pay for it, <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> and, uh, um, but. All of a sudden, they came back and said, "You know, this game looks like shit." And I said, you, know, you are absolutely <laughs> right. And and that I remember that that day going up to my standards, and and so we took at that point we took Caveman and just really turned it around, and and that was that was when I started becoming a, a real producer and a real director and designer, and and just would would never do that again. So. It was it was a good thing, but it was a bad thing and a good thing at the same time. But the game turned out great. So, okay, so Jay Barnson, I don't know if you know him, rapping Coyote. Know. Yeah. Uh, so he wrote in to ask about the rise of the Dragon, a graphic adventure game uh, that you helped design and direct. I guess he wants to know a little bit about the the story behind the game and also if there's any plans to do a sequel. Definitely no plans for a sequel. Um, that one was. Um, we we worked for Electronic Arts, then we raised some money, and, and we decided that the only way we were really going to make it is if we published our own games. And so they had an affiliate label program, but we actually ended up going with Activision at the time. At that time, they, they were sort of the only two to choose from, and we we went with Activision. And um, and our first two products were A10 Tank Killer and David Wolf Secret Agent. And David Wolf Secret Agent, even though that the structure of it was the was going to become really popular. It wasn't the the world wasn't ready for that yet, and that game bombed like crazy. And I was feeling a lot of pain from that one, and and so Rise of the Dragon was the result of that. Like I'm going to do something way better than that the next time. And so so we decided to create. I wanted I liked adventure games, but I I wanted them to be um, a better storytelling mechanism. So. We started started looking at how we could do that, and we built uh, an adventure game development system. And, and on that, we created a whole bunch of products. We created Rise of the Dragon, Willy Beamish, uh, Heart of China, and a bunch of educational stuff. And uh, and but Rise of the Dragon was just it was just a story we had laying around in the office for a long time, and and we, so we beefed it up and we turned it into that game. And I was always really proud of that game, and that game worked well for us. That one did really well. But, but I would just, after um, doing story-based games for a while, I realized that, you know, it, it just wasn't, for me, it wasn't something that I wanted to continue to do. And, and I still think, I don't know, I, I think there is a place for stories in games, um, obviously, but, but it's still hard. It, you're just constantly, should I, should I do interactivity or should I do the story? And um, you know, I think the the result of that nowadays is you see things like Uncharted and that kind of thing. But where you know you're on rails for a lot of, and then you get to do a little interaction, and you're on rails. And I, I'm not even sure that I, I enjoy those kinds of games. So I'm really happy to make more of the physics-oriented games and the the littler games. And that's that's the main reason we wouldn't do a, a story-based game. Well, uh, in 1990, we definitely get a huge huge hit for you guys, uh, Red Baron. I hope I got the, the year right for that. And I, I looked this up and I saw that Damon is credited for creating that, but I was just wondering if, you know, what you had to do with it. And then also I just want to kind of hear about the, the reaction and how you guys handled the popularity of that title. Um, well, by the time we launched Red Baron, we were owned by Sierra. And that was one of the reasons they, they bought us is because we had a new version of Stellar 7 and 250, you know, 256 colors on the way, plus we had um, Red Baron and plus we had um, um, Rise of the Dragon. 
and they saw that and that was why they bought us and, and they they got a good deal <laughs> I can tell you that because all those games were hits and uh, so it really really helped Sierra but it helped us too you know we, it was a good deal it was two way street but um, we had just uh, because of all that you know stellar seven and those kinds of things we did have quite a bit of 3d technology and and we had created a 10 tank killer and we said what's the next thing we can do so we wanted to do red baron and and we had it was pretty funny because at the time we were we were um microprose was the big um simulation company and they wanted the name red baron but we had registered it a couple of weeks before they did and they said we're going to get it anyway but they didn't. So that was that was pretty cool. And and Red Baron, I honestly I still think it was the best flight simulator we ever did. I, I love the ground based interaction with, uh, on A ten, uh, but the Red Baron, you know, just when you go out and fly one on one and here's the Red Baron coming at you and you have to take him on and he was he was good. It was you could get, you know, like goosebumps and everything when you were flying. It was a cool thing. And that was a you know a typical demon slide. He he was so good at taking, you know, you have the real world that's out there and it's this big. And if you're going to simulate, you can only simulate this much. And he could figure out how to get that much stuff in there and make it still feel great. Because, you know, back in 1990, we didn't exactly have super-powered computers to be able to run this stuff on. So, you know, we had really hot tech and, and Damon's designs were great. And, and we... It, I, it was just a good time in history for for dynamics. Yeah, it's funny how when I, you know I mentioned I was interviewing you and asked people if they like to submit questions about games, and it's funny how everybody seemed to have a different game that they thought, you know, this is my favorite for them. It's, it's all over the place. And matter of fact, Shane Stacks had wrote in uh, with praise for A10 Tank Killer. Yeah. So it sounds like there's you were saying that that one was uh, you like that because it's more focused on ground interaction. Yes. Yeah, and. And, and a big thing there was just that that was a ship or die product for us also. Um, you know, Rise of the Dragon, Stellar 7, and, and uh, A-10 Tank Killer were all. We had raised a little bit of money locally here to to fund those products and bring them to market ourselves. So we had to figure out how we were going to get them in boxes and how we were going to afford all of the stuff that was behind them. And so, so we uh, – those – it was a really interesting time in history. It was a lot of stress and that kind of thing, but the games turned out great, and we were really happy with them. And and you know we had it. We had an actual A10 pilot come in and fly it, and he used all of his maneuvers and everything that he would use in an A10, and it was awesome. And so we knew that we were onto something. And and then we took it to, I think they were the CESs back then. It was in Chicago, it was where we showed it, where we debuted it, and and it, it was just it got a great response and. And then you know it shipped into it shipped in and it started selling out and shipping in and selling out and so we knew we were really onto something. It was great. Did you ever get approached by the Air Force to design a simulation for them? Um, we actually did. There was quite a bit of stuff like that, but we ch we mostly turned all that stuff down. We did we did a few things like we did some VR things with some some VR helmet that was probably cost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars back in the day, and and we did a few things like that. But mostly we just decided that we wanted to. To focus on games because of the earlier, like I said, in the earlier days we did, we we were kind of doing different things, and we decided it was better for us to stick with with games. I got here in the 1990s when you left uh, to form Jeff Tunnell Productions, and that's when you created the Incredible Machines, Trophy Bass, and of course the 3D 3D Ultra line. Just wondering what happened that made you want to leave and start another company. You mean leave Sierra or? Or did you leave a? There, there, is this even accurate at all? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So the way it actually worked was, you know, Sierra okay. bought Dynamics in 1989, right. and then um, after putting out Willie Beamish, which was a huge project, we had, you know, I don't think probably 50 guys working on that project or something. But um, I, I had an opportunity to, to. I was still part of Sierra when I did Jeff Tunnell Productions. I. I just moved out of the main Dynamics office, and they concentrated on things like um, flight simulations and sports simulations, the front page sports, and that kind of stuff. And my my um, charter was to just go out and try to do weird little stuff. And it and it's funny because the weird little stuff actually ended up selling way better than the um, than our big simulations that we were known for. 
and our sports games and stuff. That you know, it's a little known fact, but the number one the number one selling title of all dynamics in history was our pinball game. And number two was Trophy Bass. And number three was Aces of the Pacific. Number four was Incredible Machines. So, so the things that we were known for are not necessarily the things that sold the best. And so it was fun, though. We went off, Jeff Tunnell Productions, I think we had started off with like eight guys, and, and we ended up with 15 or something like that. But we did a lot of titles, and they were really innovative and off the wall, and they, and they worked. So okay. maybe we should back up a little bit because I'm not exactly sure. I got a lot of stuff happening in 1990, but I'm not sure where it all lines up you sure. know, <laughs> month to month. Uh, so Willie Beamish, uh, what can you tell me about that? Obviously a huge, huge hit. Yeah, that one was actually uh, a lot of fun. Um, you know, we were, by that time, we really had that adventure game engine, game making system working well. And so um, we knew how to, it was like having, our, we, at that point, we had our own camera and film. And it was it was really fun. So I went out and we we found some writers from Hollywood. Tony and Meryl Parrots was was their name, and they happened to have they got tired of Hollywood and they moved to Eugene for some reason. And, and I found them, and they are the ones that they were the main writers. And so every week they would come into the office, and we would just have a story meeting, and I would figure out how to take their ideas and turn it into the adventure game system, and they would come up with more ideas. And, and it was great. That was a lot of fun. And at the same time, on the technology side, we were figuring out how to do cell-based animation. And so Willie Beamish was the one of the first, probably the first adventure game ever that had you know, true cell-based animation. And because and we that was how we got on the cover of Computing Game World, because it had that stuff in it. Because everything, remember the little adventure games are all little wonky little characters. They're all uh, pixel-oriented. And, and we created, we, we created, we would have true Disney artists and they were from Disney because you know Disney would staff up for big thing and then they would fire everybody so we had true Disney art at Disney animators doing our animation for us and then we would scan it in and clean it up and we had just like that's why there were so many people in that game <laughs> they were mostly artists i think there were maybe five programmers and and the rest were artists and it was but it was a the creative process was awesome. The, the, the little bit of new technology, adding in the cell, cell I was really proud of the, the cell animation. And then the game did well. So you add all that up, and it was great. But but there was there was pressure in Sierra for, for Dynamics not to do adventure games because they had, you know, Police Quest and all this kind of stuff. And so I said, you know, I don't care. I'll do other stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of different kinds of games I want to make. So, so we went and made a whole bunch of different stuff. Yeah, no, uh, Constantinos Demopoulos from Gnome's Lair wanted to know, if, when, he, when can he expect the Willie Beamish Kickstarter? Um, that, that'll that never happen. <laughs> I love the character. probably broke his heart. Just I love the character, and, and yeah, and, you know, even even one of my partners, Tim Asty, his his favorite game was was Willie Beamish, and he, so he thought it was a big deal when he got to come work with the guy that made, helped make Willie Beamish, so, um, but... It's just there's some things that that you're not gonna do, and that's 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 one of them. I was reading in one of the interviews about the about that game where you had talked about all the trouble you had with Sega over there, Sega CD. Yeah, the, um, by that time I was off uh, working on Jeff Tunnel Productions and um, working on new stuff, and so we had a different producer working on the the Sega CD. It, but it was really it was just that was tough to take something that was already running on the PC, which had tons and tons of memory and and a lot of colors compared to the, to the Sega and try to get it on there was was really tough and but they did make it they did make it happen and it was you know it was a real testament to the team that they were able to do that but you know I wasn't exactly on the front lines of that one so but I mean it's still painful I know I know that it was painful do you ever have plans to do a CD32 version no no <laughs> you jumped off the Amiga bandwagon long before that. No, at, at that point, you know, the PC was just taking off so much that you just really couldn't even look at other platforms. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week. Uh, 
for part three of my interview with Jeff Tunnell. I want to say though it's been a, a hell of a ride getting all the way to 200 episodes. Definitely couldn't have done this without your help and your support. So thank you very much to everyone who has donated money, uh, left comments, uh, told other people about the show on Facebook or Twitter, or Google Plus, uh, left reviews on iTunes. You know, I don't know if I mention this often enough, but you can watch these on iTunes as well in the form of a video podcast. So a lot of great stuff. Um, as always, though, if you want to uh, chip in, uh, you can go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner. You can either make a subscription, one-time payment. I've got my GOG.com affiliate link there, so if you want to uh, buy some of these classic games and see the show get a little kicked back, you can use that. No extra charge uh, to you. Okay, so what have we got here? I thought I'd do the L segment. Uh, and then maybe a little tour of the Matt Chat, uh, Matt Chat studio here. I just kind of give an I give you an idea of what I'm working with here. I think it'd probably be more fun to do that after the ale. <laughs> All right. So what have I got this week? Um, you know, it's episode 200, so I wanted to get something really nice. And this is the uh, class of '88 barley wine ale from the Dayshoots Brewery. And they've got Rogue over there on the side. <laughs> Don't know what that's doing there yet. Let's see, the essential craft brewer's recipe, uh, hoppy citrus aroma radiates from the pale amber brew, blah, 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 sturdy malt, alcohol, a nice 10.2%. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have some fun with this. A quarter century ago, a passion for craft brewing ignited across the country. Uh, each steeped in heritage, enjoy the tribute to the class of 88. So, I'm still not sure what that rogue label you know, I do like the Rogue Brewing Company, too, so I'm not sure what they have uh, to do with this, but I suppose it's very important at the moment. Uh, so let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Class of 88 barley wine from the Dayshoots Brewery. And i got to say, I'm a huge fan of barley wines. Barley wines and uh, triples are my, by far my favorite varieties, and I think this is going to be really, really good. That's uh, we got definitely can smell sort of a citrusy thing here. Uh, not that that would indicate this is going to be bitter in any way. It's a very sweet, aromatic. Uh, smells rather like a like a Belgian actually. Uh, but let's give it a toast. And here's a toast to you guys. Thank you so much for helping me get to episode 200 of Matt Chat. May there be 200 more. Anyway, let's see what this tastes like. Ah, uh, oh, I. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that is quite flavorful. Um, definitely kind of an orange-like uh, quality to this. Kind of uh, definitely citrusy. You know, I feel like I'm getting my vitamin C just from this uh, <laughs> swig of ale. Uh, very tasty. Let me try it again. Just a really, really nice taste. It's, it's uh, sweet. Uh, not bitter at all. No uh, alcohol kickback or anything like that. Um, Tastes rather like a sort of peaches and oranges, I guess, of what I'm really tasting here. A very citrusy, very nice. Um, I don't have any problem at all with this <laughs> with this sale. Uh, so I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, excellent stuff. I definitely highly recommend this. It's uh, too bad you're not here. I'd pour you a glass of it to enjoy it with me. Okay, so I said I'd give you a little tour of the Matt Cave, as it were. So uh, let's take a look around. And I'll show you some of my computers and consoles. Okay, so let's give you a little tour of the Matt Cave. Over there in the corner, you see some very good adventure games. Well, a couple of real duds, and uh, one of my favorites, Return to, Return to Mysterious Island. Lots of fun. Uh, Anna Capri, not so good. I think that's a father and son team put that game together. Very beautiful photos, but not very playable. Uh, much better game there, Pirates, which I hope you've played. And there's a uh, right below it, we've got Elite, another one of my favorites. Temple of Apshai Trilogy, Privateer, Wing Commander, two other very, very good games. Uh, there in the back you can see Telenguard. That's a sealed copy that my friend Al uh, sent me. Um, that's a very, influ uh, well, very important role-playing game. We're, we're very early, too. Notice that big box there. Oh, there we go. Ah, oh, there we go. Look at that. Pool of Radiance. And yeah, I know what you're looking at. No. <laughs> Curse of the Azure Bonds and Pool of Radiance, two of the best computer role-playing games of all time. Uh, what do we have over there? The Star Trek 25th Anniversary Pez. If you don't know who these guys are, you totally, totally suck. Uh, there's some 
poster is actually from the Sword of Fargoal uh, Kickstarter by Jeff McCord. Hopefully they'll be getting that uh, game soon. Let's see what we have there. Ravenloft, Archon, Zork, Bart's Tale, Darklands. That's a game you don't hear enough about. That's some more Ravenloft stuff. Uh, Choose Your Own Adventures, Nancy Drew. A wooden box copy of the Oregon Trail 3rd edition. That's pretty cool, like that. There's a copy of Adventureland. You remember that one? <laughs> That's really early things. I've interviewed uh, uh, Scott Adams on the show before. Oh, look who we have there. Weird Al. And there's a game I dug up from a, a landfill here in St. Cloud. It was kind of an adventure. Let's see what we have there. Seventh Guest had just picked that up the other day uh, for only a couple bucks at uh, one of the thrift shops. Uh, look, there's the barley wine. Uh, terminal, it looks like a manual, Bioshock, Defender of the Crown, hiding out back there. Ooh, hiding out. <laughs> it's amazing how this, you know, camera just zooms right into that, almost uh, automatically. Uh, there's King's Quest, a little Cody Lundin book there, uh, Mass Effect. Ghostbusters for the Atari, Icewind Dale. Oh, it's that Dark Star, really good uh, game by Jeff Williams. Scratches, you know, uh, Augustin Cordez is... Uh, they're getting pretty far along with their uh, new adventure game called Asylum. I'll see if I can get him on the show when that comes out. Here's a copy of the Colonel's Bequest, another thrift store uh, pickup. What is that? Lands of Lore, Guardians of Destiny. Ah, cute. You know, you almost forget you got some of this stuff sitting on your shelf after a while, right? <laughs> uh, Space Quest, Psychonauts. Uh, what is this? Skull. <laughs> oh, that's your sketch. Now well, that's some pretty hardcore graphics hardware there. Uh, photo editing software, if I've ever seen it. Hey, there's a, an Odyssey. Wow, <laughs> where'd that come from? Uh, that's actually uh, works. It's all uh, all there in the box. Apparently, you can get those pretty cheap. At some point, I'm going to do this game. This is a Quest for the Rings for the Odyssey. It's sort of interesting. If you open up the box, there's a lot of little pieces. It's almost like a board game. A role-playing game hybrid. Let's see what. Okay, yeah, that's my wife's stuff over there. Uh, there are a few more games, cultures. There was that Empire 2, Tomb Raider, a bunch of adventure games. Uh, I got probably hundreds of adventure games or so here. And there's some kind of neat stuff. Uh, Nathaniel uh, Talbert sent me. That's a what is that? The Commodore 1084S monitor. That's an Amiga 600 there, and this all works, by the way. Uh, there's the 1541, and somewhere here, the, yep, there's the Commodore 64 bread box. Look at that. Ah, much better, much better. The Commodore 64, one of my favorite computers. I didn't have a 600 growing up, but now I do. <laughs> okay, moving along there, we have the uh, computer that I make Matt chat with. Uh, somewhere there, yep, there. Uh, a little long in the tooth now, but it, it works. Uh, some of the equipment that I've got, a little flight stick there. A, uh, this is a pre-USB thing for when I make the podcast. You can also plug your guitars into that, it's pretty cool. Uh, otherwise, I think that's about all of, oh, look, Baldur's Gate. <laughs> There's that consulting detective game. Uh, Warcraft syndicates. Uh, there's a couple of Hot Wheels. Look at that. Bet you wish you had those, huh? <laughs> uh, pictures. Uh, tripod. Uh, these are the lights that I use. You can see these are not definitely not professional. You probably have a big pile of cords and cables like this too. Now inside these bins are my consoles. I probably should drag these out and set them up, but, uh, nah. <laughs> that's kind of cool. That little, uh, this little guy here that actually works quite well, almost brand new. I think I got it maybe for seven bucks from the guy off Craigslist. You know, never, never be afraid to hunt these guys down on, on Craigslist. Land of the Dead. Oh, here's my lovely signed signature print by Janelle Jakeways. Really, really livens up the room. Okay, so that's about it, I guess. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that little tour of the Matt Cave. <laughs> well, this is awkward. <laughs> well, it's 200 episodes. You can indulge me a little bit. 
Okay, anyway, let me get this thing uh, shut off and we'll do the quotation and that'll be it. So for the quotation, I wanted to find something from Douglas Engelbart. You probably heard the uh, sad news that he just passed away a few days ago. He's one of the uh, founding fathers of computers and uh, certainly modern computing and the operating systems and the mouse and uh, many other innovations. But anyway, the quotation goes something like this. The rate at which a person can mature is directly proportional to the amount of embarrassment he can tolerate. See you guys next week. A bear or cat, they're not sure which, has broken into this house, and I have to, of course, kill it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, she doesn't look so good up close. Look, lady, you got a saber-toothed tiger running around your house, and you're just chilling all sexy by that pipe organ. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs>